one day. Bless the Trinity. First Corinthians chapter number 11. Join me there. We're going to talk about how worthy our Lord is once again, specifically in the uh, Lord's Supper. We're going to have communion this morning in the Lord, and uh, by your vote last week, uh, very thankful that you are all in favor. The person that uh, said no, I don't know, I think he didn't show back up. I don't know. I'll go trace him down. I'll have to go find your brother. Yeah, your brother. Yeah, your brother. Yeah, your brother. <laughs> I'm so glad that you're so much different. In the good ways, no. But last week we talked a little bit about where we're headed. We, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter number 11, we covered 16 verses. And then we headed off to the idea that, hey, next week we're going to jump into a passage in the Lord's Supper. We read part of it often. But we're going to teach and preach on it. I've not uh, preached ever on this particular passage all the way through, so here we go. I know that the game doesn't start till 5.30, so we got a little bit of time. Just kidding. Part of what's going to come up in this passage is the church at Corinth conflicting between what it meant to have a great gathering and fellowship and then what it meant to have the communion and how they intermingled the two and desecrated the Lord's Supper, and that's the genesis of this part of his letter of speaking about this and how, oh, there, there he is. Oh, come on in, Ben. We got, I need you. Come on in. You're part of my illustration. But when we, but when we discussed that last week, you're saying, there you are. We're still having the Lord's Supper even though you said no. Amen. I'm glad you're coming. Praise the Lord. Come on in, will you? And join us. But we know that. When you come to the Lord's Supper, when you come to this communing time, that a lot of things go through your mind. And I'll just put it right up front for you. There's a reason why a number of years ago, and people said, what is he, nuts? He's he off his rocker? Well, that's true. It is true. But we thought, okay, can we be in a place where maybe people can come and get their elements and then go back to their seat? Why? So that maybe, and of course, if you can't, we'll bring them to you. So that then you could have more time with the Lord. You could have more time remembering what he has done, your prayer time, having more time examining. And we're going to look at that today in depth. Again, we read the passage oftentimes, uh, most all the time when we take the Lord's Supper. And so when we get into our scripture today, we have a lot of verses to read. We're going to read 17, 18 verses. We've got a, a little bit of work to do. We'll have, of course, a little introduction. Then I have uh, three little lesson points that really point to the scripture, of course, and how we teach it uh, verse by verse, line upon line. Again, when it comes to the singing part of the portion of our worship service, our time of praising him, that's biblical. We praise the Lord. We sing praises unto his name. We take time to pray at different times, at different junctures, at the end of the service, maybe in the middle or the beginning, or some time when uh, Pastor Dwayne's up here and they're, and they're singing a little bit. I will interject some prayer at different times, and so prayer is part of it. And of course, then preaching the Word of God. Peas never go wrong. We do some praising and some praying and some preaching. But when we add, as oft as we do it, the Lord's Supper, when we have the uh, baptisms that we'll have next week. By the way, gotten saved recently, gotten saved over the last few months or maybe a year or two or three, and said, hey, I've not been scripturally baptized. Get a hold of us this week. Get a hold of me. Get a hold of one of the pastors. Get a hold of the office. Give a call, and we will prepare to have you baptized next week. The, uh, the water will be in there, and the uh, heater will be on, and... Uh, We'll do some baptizing next week of whomever that would love to be baptized. Now that he's not in the service, though he came to first service at the end to partake in the Lord's Supper, there's a young guy named Patrick Mahomes. Oh, wait a minute. I mean, you're all dressed in Patrick Mahomes. But he truly is the real Patrick Mahomes, Caleb Adams, because uh, he's got the hair and everything, you know. But he got saved on Tuesday. 
So now, so now, so now we can, we, yeah. And, and Rick just shared that with me. He said he did. Now, if you tell Brownie, then he probably would say something while I'm in service, and then he embarrassed me. Yeah, I would. So that was smart of him not to tell me. But he, he ought not. And, you know, I can see being, you know, embarrassed in front of everybody. But I said, hey, if not next week, but soon we can uh, find the time and the, and the ability to baptize him. But the two ordinances of the church that are commonly given to us by the New Testament teachings of our holy God and by Scripture, and today is one of them, the Lord's Supper. We're going to really get into it and break it down a bit and realize that from last week's message, we spoke about order, and we're going to kind of follow up on that a little bit because Paul is discussing order and the ordinances in the church and how they got out of order and how we need to make sure and put them in order. Even last week, we talked about order and how order fits when it comes to the church and the home and how God would have things to be. In fact, what makes Paul's model of followship work properly is when we have godly believers as examples to follow. Examples of Christ. Examples of Jesus. That's part of God's order. I want you to come to know my son Jesus Christ as your Savior. I want him then to become your reason for waking up in the morning, your reason for going to bed at night. I want you to be sanctified unto the master's use. I want you to be set apart to be holy. I want you to be conformed to the image of my son, Jesus Christ. That's what God wants for you. So I want to put people in your life that are maybe a little stronger than you. And as Paul said, be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. There's some order in that. There's some thought that, hey, I need to learn. I need to grow. I need to have somebody walk with me, and then maybe one day I can walk with somebody through Scripture, through the truths of the Word of God, through the walk and the Word and the worship of God and how that works in your life. That's why we called our message last week a call to order. And we joked last week, we had a little vote, we had a little motion, we called to order everything, and then we did it in order. Hey, and that's why we're having the Lord's Supper. You say, you didn't have a schedule? I did not have a schedule before because I wasn't sure when we would get to this passage of Scripture, but I wanted to have the Lord's Supper in that moment, with, I mean, off of this moment of preaching the Word of God so that it really was a neat fit. So thank you, God, for your grace. That's part of his order. When it comes to order as well as chain of command, the Lord himself gave us the example to follow. I really put this out in front of you last week. Christ is no less than God. But he humbled himself and was submissive to the Father. Okay? That was our approach to Scripture because that's God's approach to the Scripture. Remember this. I said it last week. Christ's relationship with the Father did not make him inferior any more than a woman's relationship to a man makes her inferior. Because one is in order in a different place of whether they're authority or not doesn't point less value at either one. The general of the army has no more value than the private that's in the army. They're both valuable. But there's a different order to each person's calling. And when it comes to order, chain of command, the Lord gave us the example to follow. He himself, that Christ is no less than God. But he humbled himself and was submissive to the Father. In fact, it says in 1 Corinthians 11, 3, you're in 1 Corinthians, we're going to start in 17, but you can look at verse 3, I have it up on the screen, but I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ. The head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. There's a head over each spot and position in God's church, in God's family, and the way you ought to have it. God's order in the church and the home reflects his order for all things he's instituted. So we're going to go about this ordinance in order. And this church has done it for all the history that I've known it. Well, the methodology may be different or how we have the elements or stuff, but we always refer to the Scripture. We follow the Scripture. We follow what God says in His Word. It's the Word of God, and that's how we're going to do it. Don't forget, Paul the Apostle wasn't one of the original that was sitting at Jesus' meal with them. But yet, this scripture tells me, tells me, tells you, that he delivered it, the Lord Jesus Christ delivered it to Paul, and now he's delivered it to Corinth. Hmm, I guess he spent some time with Jesus. I know all of you that have studied your Bible a little bit know that. He went to the 
Bible Institute of Jesus Christ. God believes in order. And he believes in obedience to his order. Paul says, okay, I'm going to deliver these strong words again, but I'm going to do them with some exhortation and love. As, of course, our series talks about, love never fails. I'm going to deliver what you need to do to straighten things out. You've distorted, you've abused, you've caused problems, there's heresies, there's false doctrine, you've got divisions all over the place, but I'm going to tell you how to fix it with love. I want you to grasp the love of God. I want you to grasp how much he loved you that he sent his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to grasp that he put his word and he preserved it and he gave you this word right in front of you and he gave you all that you need to be able to be conformed to the image of Christ. Our message has been throughout in this study that God's love never fails. And when God's love exudes out of you, people know that God exists. But when your love exudes and it's the absence of God and the absence of the Spirit of God and it's absence of Scripture, then people basically say, yeah, you may love me, but I don't see any type of difference in your love with anybody else's. We as believers are told, we're commanded, that greater love hath no man than this, that he laid down his life for his friends, yes. But by this shall all men know that you're my disciples, that you have a love for one another. I'm going after that hard, you know I am this year. Off of live faith, love others, we've been camping out on love others. The love others is for us to love others. You say, that's the lost. Declare hope is what you do to the lost. And you do that with love too. You do that with kindness. You may have to give them the truth and serve it to them on a plate that's really difficult, but you do it with love because you love their soul so much, just like God loved you so much that he sent his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The Bible teaches us very clearly, it is for by grace that you're saved through faith, not of yourselves as the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You cannot earn the grace Though so many have tried, and one of the places in which people attempted to, in religions, to go about earning God's favor would be, I took the Lord's Supper, I gave to your church, I attended every, every time that you had a church service, I was there, am I not good enough to go to heaven? No, you're not. Jesus says, not by works of righteousness, which you have done, but according to his mercy, he saved you. By the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. When you get saved, you call on the name of the Lord to save you. God comes and sends his son Jesus into your life. The Holy Spirit takes up residency just like little Patrick Mahomes, little Caleb, and any of you that have gotten saved, you're born again today. That's what happened. Remember Art right up here? You came to know the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. I'll never forget that day. And you know something happened. To this day, you can't explain it, but you're a new creature. Old things passed away. Behold, all things become new. You see, that's the way God does things. God has a way of ordering things just the way he wants it. You see, without order, there's chaos. That's kind of what we're going after today. So we're going to bring chaos, order to chaos. There's some type of form or fashion of that quote, but maybe it's, hey, without any type of structure, there's chaos. You let everybody do whatever they want. As it says in the book of Judges, every man did that which is right in his own eyes. But it says in the screen, what can be worse than the church that is out of order in regards to Jesus Christ's head and the centerpiece of the Lord's Supper? What could be worse for us? There will be chaos if you say that Jesus Christ is not preeminent here. It's happened in many a church over many, many decades that man becomes the preeminent one. What happens to a church when that happens? They're out of order. We would be out of order if Jesus Christ wasn't allowed to have the preeminence. He has permission. Do that which you desire to do, Jesus. This is your church. It belongs to you. You are the head of the body. You are the chief shepherd. You are preeminent. You're the one that is order to be the head without that chaos if jesus is not the centerpiece of the lord's supper we're going to find out today in our teaching if he's not the centerpiece of the lord's supper there'll be chaos 
Paul warned us in 1 Corinthians 5, 7, Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, and ye are unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. He continued in that passage, Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. 1 Corinthians 5. We preached on this a few weeks ago. Maybe it was a few months ago. But think again. How God puts things in order and God has an order for everything. And if we do not have his order, and Jesus is at the centerpiece of the Lord's Supper, and you just treat it poorly, do that for a few years. Your church will be out of order because Jesus Christ will not be first. Jesus Christ will no longer be the head. It will be built upon man. And man usually has a way of destroying things. Because only by pride cometh, you know, contention before uh, Pride comes before destruction. We know that pride can get in the way. Paul now speaks to God's glory here in this passage in his order as it points to the ordinance of the Lord's Supper. We remember Jesus. You say, okay, pastor, I've got the introduction. We're going to read the passage and then we can walk out, right? Because I know all about the Lord's Supper. As always, I ask you just to let the Holy Spirit speak to you. Let the Scripture speak to you. Maybe you'll walk out of here today a little bit more serious about what it means to take the Lord's Supper. For a lost person, and I partook in the Lord's Supper communion for years in another religion, it meant nothing to me, but I did it because I was told it was part of me earning my way to heaven. I might talk about that a little bit today. I don't know. We'll see if we have time. I just challenge you today to consider that as it says there in that slide, Paul now speaks to God's glory in his order as it points to the ordinance of the Lord's Supper. We remember Jesus and the rest will I set in order when I come. That's the last words he says in chapter number 11. Let's bring order with ordinances. Thus, our title, you know I'm not too complicated, ordered ordinance. Let's bring order to our ordinance. You say you already have that, Pastor. We do. Yes, we do. But let's keep it. Let's teach the Bible as it is speaking to us. And let's be reminded of God's order and the ordinances. We will even highlight baptism a bit here in a more, a little bit uh, more in a little bit here because it does relate to my first lesson point. Go to verse number 17 in your Bibles. Let's read the passage as always. It's up on the screen, but I love when you either have your electronic device or you just have your big old Bible on your lap or a mini Bible, just follow along as I read the scripture. Again, we have lots of verses to read. Let's walk it out. Now in this that I declare unto you, Paul writes, I praise you not, that ye come together not for the better, but for the worse. Wow, that's a tough opening line for today's message. <laughs> you don't come for the better, you come for the worse. Well, it gets a little bit tougher as we go. Verse 18. For first of all, when ye come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. For there must be also heres heresies among you, that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. When ye come together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper, for in eating every one taketh before other his own supper, and one is hungry, and another is drunk. And they're not getting together for the Lord's Supper, they're getting together for a big feast. Kind of like you're going to do today for the Super Bowl party. But let me give you a simple illustration. What if there was a big party in this auditorium at 10 o'clock, 10.30, 11 o'clock, and then I stand up and say, after you all already had, like, all you can eat burnt ends, all the brisket you could eat, I'm going to make your mouth water now. Okay, let's have the Lord's Supper now. Let's give God glory because we want to make sure that God gets the glory out of it. Let's have the Lord's Supper. That's what they were doing. They were perverting, twisting, demeaning the beauty of the ordinance of the Lord's Supper. In fact, so much so that one of my top five words in the Bible comes up in verse number 22. What? Okay. Isn't that the way you're supposed to say it when it comes up? What? Is that okay? What? How about what? What? Have ye not houses to eat and to drink in? 
or despise ye the church of God and shame them that have not. What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. The church is not getting a lot of accolades from Apostle Paul right now. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you. Remember I mentioned that earlier. Less like in verse number 2 he says, as I delivered them unto you. He delivered the ordinance to the church. He's delivering the things that Jesus Christ gave to him. He's delivering them to the church. That's something we're all supposed to do when we have scripture given by the Lord God to us. We deliver it to others. Here's his delivery. That the Lord Jesus Christ, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, the, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. We read this every time we have the Lord's Supper. You say, oh, I've heard this verse. I've heard these. Well, I want you just to kind of let them sink in a little bit. Let them sink in how mighty and powerful he is about to say in this statement here. Again, repeat in verse 24. Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. You can either say, that sounds pretty good, Pastor, that's good. I've heard that before, yeah, I guess that's one. Or you can say, wow, or what? Do you not realize the profound power in his word in this instant of the accounting that Jesus Christ, his body, you are taking of it, it was broken for you personally and church corporately. Verse 25, after the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped saying this cup is the New Testament in my blood. The testator, the better testator, Jesus Christ, the New Testament, the covenant, the bind, the sacrificial, new agreement in my blood, in my blood. This is the cup of the New Testament in my blood. This do as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as oft as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation into himself, not discerning the Lord's body. We will define what it means there to be worthy or not be worthy. None of us are worthy. It's really, truly the manner in which you are receiving and taking the Lord's Supper. This is a pretty powerful statement, verse number 30. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. That goes back to the verse you just read, drink damnation. Eat and drink damnation to himself. That means you're going to go to hell if you don't eat it right. That's not what it says condemnation or damnation to your body to your physical being he explains it in the next verse that's what i just read for this cause those that take and eat in the wrong manner unworthily you may suffer some sickness you may suffer death he even says for this cause many are weak and sickly among you verse 30 for if we would judge ourselves we should not be judged judge yourself Judge yourself. That's what he's saying. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. So we're not going to be condemned with the world that's lost, going to hell, but we will face a punishment from God by being judged by him if we partake of this ordinance the wrong way, the wrong manner. That's all it says. Let's not twist the scriptures. Well, if you don't, don't take the Lord's Supper, you're going to drop dead and die and go to hell. That's not what it says. Very clearly, Paul is saying, judge yourself. We'll get into that here in a moment. Wherefore, my brother, when you come together to eat, tarry for one another. <laughs> tarry for one another. Have it be the right way for the Lord's Supper and the right way for your fellowship time in one accord at somebody's house, but do not intermingle the two. Verse 34, and if any man hunger, let him eat at home, that ye come not together unto condemnation, and the rest will I set in order when I come. Now, Father, we pray again another moment here in the name of Jesus just to really 
We just want you to be a big part of this. We want you to be the whole part of our time in the Word. As I pray often, we need your Word to come alive into each person, and only you can do that supernaturally. I'm just a man. I'm a speaker. I'm a called-out person by you. I want to be a vessel of you. So God, as I've been praying for days, please just speak through and speak into the the hearts and lives and souls and minds of your people through your word. Your word is what we're preaching and teaching. Jesus, you take the preeminence and remain in the first spot. You are the head of this church and we are under you. And I pray that you're exalted, glorified, and honored as we speak about the Lord's Supper today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Very simply, when you look at ordered ordinance, you're just reminded of something I stated earlier. That there has to be order according to God's order, not adding extra things. The word ordinance means a rule or a a law, but if it's of God, God says, hey, this is just something I put before you that I want you to have in church. But when man starts bringing extra ordinances, there oftentimes becomes this propensity and draw to want to please man and fulfill his ordinances instead of what the Lord Jesus Christ has put before us especially when it comes to the Lord's Supper. God used Jesus to initiate the Lord's Supper. Remember, in the Old Testament, the meal celebrated the death angels passing over the houses of all those doorposts and the lentils that had the blood of the lamb on them. Remember the Passover in the Old Testament. God instituted that when he delivered Israel in 400 years of bondage in Egypt. Remember as it says in Exodus chapter number 12, and the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. That's a powerful statement in Exodus Exodus chapter 12, verse 13. The Passover Passover was also a picture of something future coming. You know the future. The future coming is the Lord Jesus Christ himself becoming the Passover lamb. As many of you know, in John chapter number one, Jesus is coming toward John, and what does he say? Behold the Lamb of God. Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Remember this, he was the high priest that laid himself down. Who can lay sacrifices down? Only the high priest. The Jews didn't like that very much. In fact, that was their greatest and worst rejection is they rejected the high priest who laid himself down as the Passover lamb for the nation of Israel, for the Jew, and also, of course, for all of us. God has an order. God presented order in this ordinance. The Lord's Supper has much more profound intertwining into the church and, of course, for each of us personally. So I've got three little lesson points, as I mentioned earlier. I'll walk them out. And come into the end and take the Lord's Supper and come to the Lord's Supper table. The first one I have for you is this. In order in the ordinance allows, firstly, for the heresy and the division to be crushed with complete repentance. I use a strong word there. For the heresy and the division to be crushed with complete repentance. You see... If there's going to be order and there's anything that's messed up in this ordinance, then it has to be crushed. When there is heresy being uh, taught and and taught in uh, churches and things like that, when there's divisions that come, when it's treated as though it's truth, he says right here very simply, when you look in the scripture, you say, hey, verse number 18 says, first of all, when you come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. That comes from a previous time where there's divisions over who was baptized by who. Verse number 19 says, For there must be also heresies among you, that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. Consider this. If they're not repented of, if we have any type of heresy, any type of division, it will destroy this church. It'll cause a major, major problem. I'm not talking about just the simple sins that we commit on a regular basis to one another. I'm not talking, I'm talking about letting heresy and division and false doctrine be taught in the church. 
it will destroy completely. It'll add chaos where God wanted order. And the statement here is that if you want to have order and ordinance, you just have to know that it allows us to say, heresy, division, be crushed and get out of here. We repent of that. It's false teaching. It's wrong teaching. The divisions that came here, they were awful. Think about this. A food and drinking party is not the best way to celebrate the Lord's Supper. That's what this church did. That's what the church at Corinth did. You cannot mingle the fellowship meal with the communion celebration. It doesn't go that way. God would rather have you not. You see, this meal needed to be restored to its proper meeting in that church. And the proper meaning, very simply, is to put Jesus Christ first and then bring unity behind that. The lack of unity in the Holy Spirit and the divide over God's ordinances speaks to a bigger problem in the church. The glory does not go to the best teacher. It doesn't go to the most spiritually mature or even to the pastor. It belongs to God, period. But what goes on and creeps in is stuff like happened in verse number 20. When we come together, therefore, in one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. Oh, yes, it is. No, it's not. Yes, it is. You're coming together for what? You're making a contrary message to everyone. When you come together, it's not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, everyone taketh before other his own supper, and one is hungry and another is drunk, and it kind of leads to the place where you think, oh, the rich people that are well-to-do can do whatever they want, and the other people, they just want to come and partake. That's even another part of this message that he's bringing to the Corinthian people. Again, more mature, maybe a little bit older, maybe they got a little bit more money, maybe they're just the better people in church are being a stumbling block to the other people that just want to do that which they've learned is right by the word of God. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter number 1 to be reminded of this division. In fact, go to 1 Corinthians 1 if you want real fast, it's not far. Verse number 11, it says, For it hath declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. So that's where this goes. It's contentions, divisions. Now this I say that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, I am of Paul, so I am of Cephas, I am of Christ. Of course, those are the ones that are a little bit better than all of you because I didn't say that I was of Cephas or Paul. I'm of Jesus Christ. I'm better than you. That's really the context of what they're saying. If you're in Christ... There's no need to even, even proclaim it. Is Christ divided, he says? Is Christ divided? Does he bring division? No. You say, well, he, yes, he did. I know. In this case, we're talking about in the church. We're not talking about the division that he clearly made between the lost and the saved. About his preaching of his truth. We're talking about how people in the church can use Jesus Christ and their maturity to cause a divide because they say they're of somebody who's better than somebody else. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? What a great question. What a little sarcasm. Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius, lest any should say that I had baptized in my own name. I don't even want to be in the midst of your prideful, division-making accolades that you're given to men, that you're given to other people, and attaching yourself as having more value. There's where order is out of order because they are weighing themselves to be of more value because they're of somebody better than another. When it comes to order in the Lord, in this order in the uh, ordinance. It allows us to throw out the heresy and the divisions. They need to be crushed with complete repentance and say, look, let's realize what this is all about. This is a serious thing. You guys, you're just used to coming to a Bible teaching, Bible believing church, and maybe some of you are newer here, or you come to different places and stuff, and they may have this. You may not have realized that the Lord's Supper can be something that is used for manipulation. 
And it could be a place where it's mingled with just, hey, it's a good luck charm. If we just do the Lord's Supper more often, then we're going to be blessed by God more. That's not the way God meant it to be. The second lesson point that I have for you in this order, ordered ordinances. Order in the ordinance allows for the body and the blood to be honored with serious remembrance. Okay. Okay. We're going into the part of scripture that you're familiar with. Okay. Okay. Because we were, just a minute ago, in verse 22, saying, what? What's happened to you? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? No, I praise you not. Let me tell you the way it's supposed to be. That the body and blood of Jesus Christ is to be honored with serious remembrance. That's the Lord's Supper. We don't mess around with it. We honor the Lord Jesus Christ. We remember the Lord Jesus Christ. We remember the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Remember Christ's presence in the born-again Christian. Do you know that that's what we're doing? Is remembering that Jesus Christ is in you. I guess you're not very enthusiastic about that. Do you remember what he did for you? Yeah, sure you do. But yet sometimes we come up and do this and we're having a tough time trying to figure out why the table's not bigger or the microphone's not turned up for the pastors to pray. We remember the precious salvation given by faith through the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is our Passover. We remember that he's coming again. We make a public confession when we come to the Lord's Supper. This is a public confession of Jesus Christ. This is the blood of my New Testament, which is shed for many of the remission of sins, he says in Matthew. We are to give praise and give thanksgiving unto him. The Lord's Supper is an act of praise and thanks. And we're thinking about what the next thing is. We're forgetting. We don't remember. We just say, oh, I just know it's a nice memorial. How about, do you ever go to the footstone or the headstone of someone who's passed on before you every once in a while to remember their life and remember what they mean to you? This is a whole lot deeper than that. We'll have Valentine's Day on Tuesday. Don't forget your loved one. Okay, I'm good. That's fine. But well, how is it that the Lord's Supper gets treated so nonchalantly? I'm not saying that's everybody. I'm just saying if it's an example in the church at Corinth. You see, the body and blood needs to be honored. Verse number 23 says that Paul says, hey, the Lord delivered this to me and I'm delivering it to you. As I mentioned earlier, verse number 24, this is my body. Verse number 25, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. Oft as you drink it, do it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. That is, remembering that he's coming. The seriousness of the Lord's Supper needs to be revealed in our reverent attitude toward the holy sacrifice of Jesus Christ. This requires our obedience to his personal command. Do this. This do in remembrance of me. It's a personal command that he's making to you and me of himself. And Paul is reiterating what he said in Luke, Luke's gospel. You think, I guess that's good. Again, why in the world would I have you come up and get the elements and walk back slowly so that you can remember, so that you can examine, so that you can spend some time. And this is not just some fun little Bible lesson, but rather, okay, wow, wait a minute. Serious moment here. Got to get a little bit more serious about things. Yes, we ought to. 1 Corinthians chapter number 10, verse number 16 and 17. The cup of blessing which we bless is not the communion of the blood of Christ. The bread which we break is not the communion. Is it not the body, the communion, the blood, the body of Jesus Christ? For we being many are one bread and one body. For we are all partakers of that one bread. I'm wondering... Continually wondering if this is one of those classic examples of 
obeying what God would have me to do without my heart really being in it. I guess we get pretty good at that as we've been saved for a while. I'll just do what God asks me to do, even if I don't want to do what he wants me to do, or my heart's not really in it, or yes, I love him, and or here we are at a place of saying, okay, I'll be obedient because it's a command. I'll represent the memorial because I remember what he did for me. That sounds pretty good. Maybe it's partly that we have become apathetic or hard or cold or it's an inward thing. That's God's work. God knows your heart and mine. He knows where I'm at. When God says it's a time for examination, a time for participation, it's a time for adoration unto him. Order in the ordinance allows for you and me to realize, hey, the body and blood it takes a whole lot of remembrance for us. And lastly, order in the ordinance allows for our guilt and sin to be self-judged with complete examination. It says in verse number 27, Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Verse number 28 says, But let a man examine himself. Every one of you in this room, 120 of you, give or take, you are to examine yourself. I'm not here to examine you. And it even says there that, yeah, the Lord will do some examining, but you're to examine yourself. It's interesting. What does an exam mean to you? We say it once in a while. You get a test. I've mentioned it. Sometimes people don't like an exam because they don't want to be tested on what they do or don't know. Well, how about this right here? Because this is a spiritual matter. Why are you and I not examining ourselves? You want to take the risk that God sees that you're not examining yourself and responding to him, and then you go back to him, and he goes back to you and say, okay, make that thing right, because you may suffer condemnation. You might get sick. You might drop dead. You might sleep. That's what the scripture's saying. Do we not take this serious? I think you do. I'm just concerned that as time goes on, the generation after us is less concerned than you are over what is true and what is right and what is holy before God. Each generation gets a little bit lazier on the things that are important. This is ordered ordinance. I sure hope you realize that this is really important. And you're not hemming and hawing because somebody's not walking fast enough to get up so you can get to lemon elements. But rather you would take that solemn time of three minutes and spend some time examining yourself. As I've got to do. I've got to examine myself. Well, God's working on me. That's the scriptures say. Search me, O oh God. And I got that. David did not need God to examine him in Psalm 51. Go check that out sometime. He examined himself. And he knew that he was a rotten sinner who had done wrong, and he was crying out to God to forgive him and restore the joy of his salvation. Cleanse me. Purge me. That's the way the Lord's Supper time should be for us. Now let's get it over with, read the passage of Scripture, and go out and have lunch. We're close, right on the precipice of messing around with the Lord's Supper just like they did. Because I know me, and i got to deal with me, who's always thinking of the next thing to do, instead of just sitting right here and going, this is your time, Father. This is your time, Jesus. This is your time, Holy Spirit. This is your time, church. We need to honor you, glorify you, self-exam, and remember what you have done for us, Jesus Christ. And if that takes four or five or six minutes, God, forgive us. God, forgive us. And we're hemming and hawing over five minutes. Forgive us for the way we've gotten. Where we're so tired over the things that are of God and so excited about the things of ourselves. This is important to him. I was in a religion where they taught that the man who stood up with the bread and the wine could transubstantiate it. You know what that means? Change the substance. And they still teach it. And I believed it. 
So much so that I went every time I could go because I knew it was the right thing to do to earn my favor to God and it did not have anything to do with it. Well, it's easy to get on those other religions. I just know one thing. This is the truth of the word of God. Thus saith the Lord. He's not speaking of whether or not you're worthy in, worthy in Jesus Christ. Look at the screen and I'll be finished. Unworthy would refer to our character of the qualifications for participation. No one's worthy. But what he's saying here in the text, taking of it unworthily without examining yourself properly, we are not commanded to be worthy. We are commanded not to partake in an unworthy manner. We are not to make a mockery of the supper. Well, I honor Jesus and I think about him, I know. But how quickly am I thinking about something else? How quickly am I diverting my attention to make sure this is right and this is right and I'm right? What is the matter with me? That I would not treat it the way that the Lord's Supper ought to be treated. Hebrews chapter number 12 says this very simply. You knew I might go there. Speaking of chastening, because he does say it in here, verse number 32, but when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord. So your brothers and sisters were, the God, were God's children, were his sons and were daughters. And he says, hey, I chasten you here. So maybe I, I get a hold of you, Mark. I'm going to get a hold of you and say, hey, you better examine yourself and get some things right with me. And ye have forgotten, it says in Hebrews 12, the exhortation which speaketh unto you is unto children. My son despise not the chastening of the Lord, nor faint. When thou art rebuked of him, for whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. This is not just to apply to the parents with their kids. That's fine, it's good, it's right. But this is the Father in heaven who saved your soul through the redemptive blood of Jesus Christ, who said, you are now joint heirs with my son and you can partake even though you're not worthy spiritually speaking, but now I make you worthy in Jesus. The worthiness is whether or not you've got the right heart attitude or the right manner by which you're partaking in it. That's what he's speaking to me about. And he has every right to chasten me, but he says before that he would even chasten me that I would examine myself and make it right before he has to come and make it right on me. Ooh. It's like you do teach your children, hey, you want your brother you better go over there and tell him you're sorry. No, I won't. You better go tell him you're sorry. Because if you don't, I'm going to deal with you. You notice I didn't add, uh, speak of my daughters because they never hit each other. Oh, dear Lord. Your daughters never fought, did they? Yeah, they're like, Pfft. The boys are funny. I'm not going to say that I'm sorry. Oh, then I will deal with you. How about you say to your brother and sister, please forgive me, I was wrong. How about if you and I go to the Father and say, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, that's salvation, right? But God also says in 1 John, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You say, I need to get saved over again? No, he opens up the portals of heaven as Father through the Son, Jesus Christ, and says, hey, I've already redeemed every one of your sins trespasses are washed away as far as the east is from the west. But you know you've broken fellowship with me. You ought to examine yourself, Mark, because you've made a mess out of some things. Your arrogance, your pride, your mouth, your attitude, it's wrong. We approach the Lord's Supper today, the Lord's Supper table, with brevity and seriousness, I say this often, as redeemed sinners by grace. Isn't that great? You're born again today. You're a redeemed sinner by grace. Hallelujah. So now he's made you worthy in Jesus to partake. Now it's up to us not to partake unworthily, which is our manner, our attitude. But rather we say, God, I'm going to examine myself. It says on the screen, our examination prayer is filled with honor and glory to the one we remember, Jesus Christ. Bow your heads for a word of prayer as we prepare to come and get the elements for the Lord's Supper. Father in heaven, thank you. 
for this beautiful time in your word. Strong words that you have for us, but they're, they're really good for us. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Made in the likeness of men. Fashion. Servant. Humbled. Obedient unto death. Oh, Jesus. In this time of examination for every one of my brothers and sisters, I pray, God, that you would just speak and they would take the time for you to work through things in their own lives, but they to work things through with you. And I pray for anyone who's lost today that they would see it's for by grace that you're saved through faith. Not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Because if we could boast about it, we would. We only boast about you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Please stand.